Well, hello again, everybody. I'm not at Oliver Woods, I'm at home. Something went wrong with the recording. I don't know what. Zoom is quite a difficult program to learn. So I'm going to record this at home and hopefully it will go just as well as yesterday. And I actually might go a little bit faster at home because I don't have to circulate or wait. And you can just pause the video when you want to get some clean water, have a break, have a coffee, um, just catch up. And then you can rewind and watch things over again. So I'm going to switch now to my overhead camera. We had problems with that yesterday. And it's so much better to be just controlling all that from home. So I'm going to... I'm going to go to my laptop here and I'm going to uh, share my camera so you can see my painting area. Hopefully you'll be able to see it well. And we'll share that. And there's the painting area. I might brighten it up a little bit. The lovely thing about this new camera is I can um, zoom in, zoom out. I can brighten up the, the um, color a little bit, the exposure. I can, it's got a little light on it. I haven't quite figured out all the good settings yet, but there we go. Right, so we're going to be, for this next eight weeks, we're going to be nice and loose and get used to being a little less tight with our paintings. That, that's going to be very hard for me because I am a tight painter and I do tend to like to do things sort of realistically and quite, and quite detailed. So it's a very good exercise for me to try and loosen up a little bit. And it doesn't mean the whole thing has to be loose and it doesn't mean it has to be unplanned. Tightening up right at the very end of the painting and putting a little bit of detail in is what brings it all together at the end. So we haven't painted for a long time. Some of us have never painted before. You're brand new. We're going to do some exercises first to loosen you up, get you used to using watercolor paint, get you used to diluting the paint. And if you did all this with Zoom yesterday, you know you can just fast forward. But there were some people that were waiting for the video. So I'm gonna go through it for them and let's start. Now for these painting exercises, I'm going to use just practice paper, something I haven't really done very much in the past. I like, really like this Canson XL watercolor paper. It's 140 pounds, it's not cotton or anything, but it's cold press and it, it behaves quite nicely for a cheap paper. I get mine in Walmart. It's even cheaper in Walmart. There's 30 sheets in there. I think it's about $11 in Walmart. So great value if you don't want to be using your really expensive good paper just to practice. Now we're going to practice being loose with everything, with the pencil, with the brush. And I like using for watercolor, I like using these little mechanical pencils that have a very thin lead because really you don't want too much pencil graphite actually is in the pencil. You don't want too much pencil graphite on your paper. It will, it will get all smudgy and get in your watercolor and you kind of want your pencil lines to disappear under your watercolor in the end. So that's why I like this kind of pencil for watercolor. And of course, for all other things for uh, sketching, I have all kinds of other pencils for, for that. Now, what I want you to do very loosely and using your, your judgment, because that's a really good thing to learn how to do, I want you to put um, five little boxes. Um, we're gonna have five boxes and then five more boxes. And you know what, I missed out these five boxes yesterday because you, know, you get carried away and everything. So we're gonna put uh, three rows of five boxes I don't know why I missed those yesterday. I was in a flap, a little bit of a flap because of the camera situation. So just, this is loose. We don't need to get a ruler out or anything. So just with your pencil, one, and they're about an inch square, two, three, four, five. They don't all have to be the same size. Uh, they just need to be there to put your paint in. And then five more, about just a little bit more than an inch square. I don't want you to get tight with anything at the beginning of paintings or the beginning of drawing. Try and keep everything pretty loose. Your lines don't have to join up. Your brush marks don't have to stay inside these lines. We're just gonna pop them all in there. And for the first row, you can use a gray from your, your paint box. Now, some of you might not have a gray, but you might have a black. 
So you could use that, or you might have a dark blue, like an indigo or something, or you might have a sepia. Just choose one of your darkest paints that you have in your paint box. I have a Payne's gray, which I quite like, but I don't use it very often because it's a, it's a very recognizable gray and it, it can overtake, overpower everything. And I'm gonna use my number eight brush, just be a little bit loose with that. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with a very strong mix of Payne's gray or black or a dark paint here. And then we're gonna add water and get to an extremely light value of Payne's gray or your dark paint at the end here. So let's try that. And some of you are beginners, I know, and some of you are just new to watercolor. So you need some practice on how to use the paints. I'm just gonna get my little sponge. I'm going to make a clean, it's a clean area in my palette. I don't usually clean my palette up very much because all this paint that's in here can be re-wetted and used for something. And it's always lovely to have a mixture of colors in your mix. So you put a little bit of water in your palette. It can be, um, any kind of a palette. You can use a plate, it doesn't have to be a paint box. You can use a separate palette, a uh, styrofoam plate, a china plate, whatever you like, just somewhere to mix. You put a little bit of water in there and then you get your, you know, agitate your paint. If your paint hasn't been used for a while, you're gonna have to put a bit of water on it to get it moistened again and agitate it, stroke the paint and make a nice dark puddle of your dark gray or black or dark brown. Now, I want to do a don't do this. Don't do this like you're stirring a cake and push your paint all over the place. You need to keep it in a nice intense little puddle so that you've got really nice, intense, strong color. If you push it all out, you're diluting the color. Now don't wash your brush after you've done this because then you're going to be diluting the color again. Right now, you've been agitating the color into the water. Your brush is loaded with color and so it's ready to go. And don't wash all that lovely paint away. So get your brush, any type of brush really, but try not to go too small and just fill up this square with some nice dark paint. This is, you're going to try and put down your darkest value of your darkest paint that you have, preferably a Payne's gray or some kind of Davies gray, Jane's gray. There's a few grays. Payne's gray is always the favorite. It's a very blue gray. It can be mixed with loads of other colors to make very pretty colors. Now, once we've got that one, we want to dilute it a little bit, just a little bit to get a slightly lighter gray. So I'm gonna get a little bit of water and I'm not gonna dilute the whole puddle. I'm gonna put a little bit of water at the edge here and draw some of that gray into it. And I'm going to try that. Yeah, that's, that's good. Let's try it and paint my second little box. Now, the thing to remember is you don't always want to start your watercolor painting with your gray or your paint full load pigment dark. You quite often want to start it with very light pigment and build up your darks with layers. They'll, they'll be more beautiful. They'll be more colorful. They'll be less thick and muddy if you build them up in light, transparent layers. So that's why we're practicing this, because you really don't very often want to go to that dark paint. Now I'm going to get a little bit more water on my brush. And again, I'm going to just put it at the side of that puddle. And I'm going to paint. And I, if I think it's a little dark, I can add a little bit more water. I'm going to paint my third value box. And when a paint is light, it's called a light value. When it's dark, it's called a dark value. Value is light or dark. I'm going to get a bit more water and paint the fourth one. And then I'm gonna wash my brush out by really swishing it in the water, not just dip, but real swish. And I'm just gonna get a little bit of that paint and paint almost even more water. Just almost paint like a dirty water box here with extremely light gray. If you were painting, say a white dress or a white drape, a white, anything white, this gray here or this gray here would be a beautiful shadow color. You wouldn't want this gray on something that's supposed to be delicate. 
and white. So that's our first set of value boxes. It's always good to label things. So I'm going to put uh, Payne's gray here. I always spell it the English way, E-Y, but I think the American way is A-Y, and I don't know what they put on the tube, so it doesn't matter which you put here. The second one, we're going to mix my favorite gray, not just my favorite gray, but most artists, this is their go-to favorite gray. And this is going to be ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. And they are both non-staining colors, and you can lift them off, wash them back, you can vary the amounts of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue to make different grays, a brown gray or a blue gray. You can add just a touch of burnt sienna to ultramarine blue to make it less intense and bright. And the two colors together do something that's called granulating. That means, and you can see the Payne's gray is doing it a bit here because it probably has some ultramarine in it. That means that when you put enough water with the pigment, and you put it on your paper, as it starts to dry, the pigment starts to separate and you get a, a sort of a granulated effect on your paper. I'm just looking to see if I've got anything that looks like that. Can't really see that here, but it's a gorgeous effect. And it's one of the reasons that many artists love those two colors together. So let's mix them to make a gray. Now you're gonna need a lot of blue to make this this gray and I'm going to use this one has had ultramarine blue and burnt sienna here before so I'm going to just wet that up with some water remember like can you hear me swishing I'm really swishing my brush in the water to get it full of water I'm going to get some more ultramarine blue I'm looking at my hand it's covered in paint so it's a real mess so I'm going to get a bit more ultramarine blue and then I'm going to get I'm going to wash my brush because I don't want to contaminate my, this is my burnt sienna too much. This is a Daniel Smith burnt sienna and a Daniel Smith ultramarine blue. Daniel Smith is a very fine artist quality paint. I think this one was about $19 for a tube. You don't need to spend that much. I used Winsor Newton Cotman for years, a very high quality paint. It's a student quality, but you can get a tube for about $5 a tube, a very good paint. So you don't need to spend a lot of money. Now I've mixed a gray here that is quite blue. So quite a lot of blue. And I'm just remembering we need it dark for our first darkest value. So there I've got a nice dark blue, Let me put that down. And I'm going to paint here again, load up my brush. I've got to really swish my brush, load it up with paint so that I can paint that first box with a lovely dark gray and you'll see it's not very different to the Payne's gray it's not quite as black because quite often the manufacturer might put a bit of black pigment and ultramarine or maybe they might put phthalo they vary it um, from manufacturer to manufacturer but it is very heavy on blue and if it has one of those granulating blues in it will it will granulate and this one is I can see a little bit as it's separating it looks like it has some phthalo blue in too you can always tell because the manufacturers will put the pigment numbers and colors on the tube so you can actually find out what they used if you know how to read the pigment colors again I'm adding a little bit of water to this next one and I'm painting this next box slightly slightly lighter value. Now this is just a standard gray. If I add more blue, I'll get a very blue gray. If I add more brown, I'll get a very brown gray. If I add more water, I'll get a very light gray. And these two colors will granulate. So if you add quite a bit of water or put them on wet paper, you might get a beautiful granulating effect where the pigment separates so I'm adding a little bit more water each time, like I showed you. I'm not picking up my palette again, because it's a bit mucky. And I'm not fussing, not fussing with my brush strokes either. I'm adding a little bit more water to that paint. And then a bit more water to get it very, very light. Not enough. See, when you put down your first brush stroke and you judge it's not light enough, you just go get some water and spread it out with some water or put some more pigment in, which is called charging. There, and we're down to the lightest one there. Now, when I was at Oliver Woods yesterday, and you know, I'm chatting to everyone and we're doing things, I forgot to do the rose, rose sienna, cobalt blue, and rose one. So, this is a new one for everybody. If you're actually watching the video again after taking the class yesterday, you get to practice a new one. 
So raw sienna. Now, if you don't have raw sienna, you can use um, yellow ochre, but yellow ochre is quite opaque and it can make mud. I prefer raw sienna because it's more transparent and much less likely to make mud. When you put more than two colors together, you, you're in danger of making mud if they're not a good transparent color. So we're gonna use cobalt blue, which is fairly transparent. And it's a much gentler blue than ultramarine. It's similar, it's a warm blue, but it's gentler. And we're going to use, I have permanent rose, but you might have any type of rose. You might have rose madder, you might have quinacridone rose, you might have alizarin crimson, anything that looks like a pinky rose paint, then you can use that to make this gray. Now, what we're actually doing, what every gray and brown is, is the three primary colors mixed together. But you can see from my palette here, which is all reds here and reds here, these are all different reds. So red being a primary color, you need to have at least one cool red, a cool red like rose madder or permanent rose. And this is Perol red and this is cadmium red. These are warm reds. These are orangey reds. You need one of each. It doesn't matter like whether you buy Perol red or whether you buy um, vermilion, which is very orangey or cadmium red or quinacridone red, as long as it's an orangey red. And then for your other color, you need to get a, a pinky red, which is a cool red. It has more blue in. So you need something like a permanent rose or a quinacridone rose or a rose madder or just rose or alizarin crimson is a good one too. But alizarin stain. So I quite often stay away from the staining colors for beginners and less experienced painters, because if you make a mistake, you can't take the staining colors off the paper. But if you make a mistake with the non-staining colors, you can wash them off quite often and fix something. It's not quite so scary. So we're going to start with raw sienna, which uh, is here. So I have a variety of makes in my paints now. I used to be a Windsor and Newton girl through and through. And then a lot of good paint manufacturers came on the market, like M. Graham, that make their paints with honey and Daniel Smith. And I've sort of, oh, and Quar, which are made by Golden Paints, and Golden are thought to be the best in the industry. So I've got a real mixture now of ones that I like. This is M. Gray and made with honey, this raw sienna. And I'm gonna add some, gonna add some permanent rose. Just a touch, not too much, because permanent rose, and um, this is artist quality Windsor Newt one, $35 for a tube. Uh, it's quite strong. And it stains more than the Cotman. The Cotman one never, the student quality one never stained because it wasn't real. It was a hue. And now I'm going to get a little bit of cobalt blue. Actually, probably quite a bit of cobalt blue because we need it gray, not brown. And I'm going to add that. Now, this will be a much, much softer gray and more opaque than the ultramarine blue one. So we're going to put that down. I like this gray for painting roads and sidewalks. And if you add a little bit more rose or a little bit more yellow, you can get the light sunlit sidewalks. And if you add a little bit more blue, you can get the shadow of the sidewalks. It's surprising how warm the gray is when, when you're painting a road or a sidewalk in sunlight. Again, we're going to add a little bit of water to that and paint a slightly lighter value. And like I said, yesterday, I think I went a bit slower waiting for people to catch up, but you can pause. If I'm going too fast, just pause your video. And a little bit more water. This is actually very ideal to be doing it quietly at home. And I really, really hope it's recording properly. And then a little bit more water. and a little bit more water to make it very light. There we go. There, I just wanted to check the machine was recording. I'm a little paranoid after yesterday. Now, we've practiced all of those 
grays and making them lighter in value, we mix them in our palette. And now I just want you to practice loosely mixing the gray on the paper. So I'd like you to draw a couple of rectangles, however you like, just, just because we're gonna put some paint on and uh, I just wanna see if the exposure needs to be a little bit less bright so you can see the paper properly, maybe a little bit less bright. There we go. Really hard to know how it's gonna turn out, but there we go. So I'm gonna mix these on dry paper and we're gonna start with, on this one, we're gonna start with your raw sienna. I need to clean my palette again. Got a clean spot. Ah, hard to find a clean spot. Here we go. Let's just go to this one. I've got two palettes on the go. I have a ridiculous amount of paint. I am drawers full of paint. I'm just, I'm kind of addicted to buying paints and paint brushes and paint supplies. And there's nothing else in my life I really spend money on. <laughs> love, love art supplies. So this is, this is my raw sienna and this is my yellow ochre. I don't use yellow ochre very much. Like I said, raw sienna is nice and transparent. So we're gonna get some raw sienna and we're gonna make it watery. Get used to making your paints so that they are a puddle. Now a puddle means you can move this thing around, it's wet, it's shiny. It's not a dry little cake of paint here. You can't, you can't paint with dry little cakes of paint. You have to get it mixed up with some water and then your brush needs to be loaded with it. So you need to just roll your brush in it so it's, it's loaded with paint. And then we're going to, to get a bit more paint on my brush. We're gonna put this on the paper just very randomly. There's some, you know, a few strokes of raw sienna. We're just practicing for what we're gonna do later. Oh, I got some gray in there, doesn't matter. After that, while that's still wet, we're gonna work wet in wet. I'm going to get a little bit of permanent rose, just a little bit, or alizarin crimson or whatever pinky rose you have and stroke that in here and there so that they mix on the paper. And you can still see, you need to still be able to see some of the raw sienna. The rose should not be, uh, let me show you what it should not be. Let me get some on my brush. It should not be strong like this. We're not going for the strong colors yet. These are background colors, like sunset sky colors. So unless you are really doing a, um, strong painting where your sky is just going to sing and maybe next week we'll do something similar go with the lighter pinks and i'm going to just i'm going to get a kleenex always have a kleenex handy because if anything goes wrong mm -hmm. before everything dries you can just get things off with the kleenex now this is my artist quality permanent rose and it's a pretty good staining rose actually whereas windsor newton cotman one a cheaper one, not bad on this paper, is uh, non-staining. And I got used to using the cheap one for years. I was quite shocked when I got the expensive one. I'll put that in. Now we're going to add some ultramarine blue to that to make our third color. We're going to make it a little bit gray. So we've got ultramarine blue here. And I'm going to add just a teeny touch, just a touch of burnt sienna to make it just a little bit gray, not, not gray gray. And I'm gonna put that in as if it's cloud. We are practicing, we're not, we're not fussing with this. We're just practicing how do you get some wet and wet brush strokes to blend together on the paper. You can put, you can wet the paper first too, but sometimes it makes it a little bit too wet. We'll practice that later. Now we're going to practice mixing raw sienna and cerulean blue, which are two beautiful gentle colors for, for light skies. And I will wet the paper first with this one. And good advice that I was reminded of yesterday. If you are, I'm trying not to sort of change brushes too much, but if you're doing a bigger painting or you want to wet your sky really quickly, a nice uh, flat square brush is good for that. You can just get some water on your brush and quickly with horizontal or vertical strokes, wet your paper. 
and I have a lot of this is about an inch inch and something it might just be an inch I'm looking at it I think it's an inch the other brushes that are lovely for that are the uh, haki brushes or hake brushes some people call them h-a-k-e but I think it's pronounced haki and they are made either from goat hair or sheep hair, it just depends on the manufacturer. They hold a lot of water and they're very soft. So these brushes, and they come in a load of sizes, they are very good for wetting the paper and for putting really soft washes on. I'll demonstrate with this one what a lovely soft wash we'll get. So we're gonna go back to the, um, there are some artists who will do a whole painting with a hockey brush. I think it gets to look a bit too, um, stylistic when you do the whole thing with you kind of, it kind of it gets a bit boring but they are good for big washes so I'm going to put on that wet paper with my hockey brush the raw sienna and I'm going to use cerulean blue with it to make a sort of a, a beautiful blue gray sky I'm going to find my cerulean I got I've got two I'm going to use I have a cheap one a cheap one is more intense. I have a cheap one made by Van Gogh paints. They're student quality, beautiful, beautiful paint. They're only about $5 a tube and well worth it because they have beautiful pigments in them. I'm getting a little bit of that cerulean blue and I'm going to, I put a little bit too, you know, when you get a bigger brush, you get a bit carried away. I'm going to put a little bit of that cerulean in the raw sienna and it will, It'll make some grays on the paper or have some blues and you need to really wait for it to all blend itself out. So use whatever brush you want to experiment with. I have too many brushes. One, one that's really lovely. This is a, um, a Da Vinci Casio. It's a man, man-made, um, what do you call it? Hair, not hair really. It's, it's a man-made fiber. And it's done in what's called a quill because they used to use a, a feather quill to bind them onto the wooden handle. And then it's got some copper wire to tie it on. I just think they look rather beautiful. It's also quite big. It's a number four, but it's nothing like um, a number four in an ordinary round brush. I'm just, I'm grabbing, sorry. I'm grabbing my number four in an ordinary round brush, which is quite a small brush when they go up into these quill brushes, the sizes are different. So a number four is quite, quite big. And I'd really like a number six in that brush too. I'm just looking over there. I've got a huge brush. I got it at Michael's to try it because it was so cheap. <laughs> this is a 50. Um, this is a size 50. So if you were doing a really, really big painting, I, I haven't used it for anything yet. I only bought it because I thought it looked interesting nice wooden handle but uh yeah that would be that would be good right i'm going to tear my page off of here so that i can go on to my next page and the camera's not in the way and for this page i want to do some experiments of mixing or putting paint onto dry paper and putting paint onto wet paper and then dripping water into it and then mixing it on dry and mixing it on wet. So you can kind of see for yourself the different outcomes for that. I've got a, one I did before and one I did yesterday. And I also showed how using the ultramarine blue and the burnt sienna, you can wash these colors back. I'm just, and the better washed back with a stiffer brush, you can do a little stiff brush or a big stiff brush or a tiny, tiny, um, tiny brush. Got, let me get one of my tiny ones. Sorry, as I lean away from the microphone, you'll probably get, I'll get a little bit. So I've got a little tiny brush that is called an eradicator, and it's specifically for eradicating tiny bits of paint. So if I get this sort of stiff brush and I agitate with it and just dab with a Kleenex, just agitate, dab with the Kleenex, I can get some beautiful, beautiful lines washed out of my paint. Now I put this paint on here yesterday and because it's on cheap paper it's even easier to wash out and I am now able to get some, I could be doing veins on a leaf that are light or 
um, grass in a, if I painted the landscape dark, I could be pulling out some grass. Or if I had a bigger brush, I can be agitating more out of here. I can get more paint out. So it's, it's a really useful to use colors that you can wash off of the paper easily if you want to do that. I was showing here how you can also make clouds. I've done the gray sky, but then I could come along with a bigger brush and agitate the paint in sort of circular motions. And I could take out some, some clouds after I've done the whole wash of the gray sky. As long as I use those non-staining colors, the rougher your paper, the harder it will be to do. Now this uh, cheap paper is quite smooth. And of course, once you've done that, there's nothing to stop you going back in and putting in some different color into your clouds. Now raw sienna, what do I do with my other paint box? Oh, there it is. Raw sienna is a color you often see in the sky and mix it with a little bit of pink. And sometimes at the base of the cloud, you will see that sort of raw sienna color. So if you wanted, you could go put that in after you've washed, washed out some of that color, or you could put it in before and then it will be underneath. It's If you use the right pigments, there's a lot you can do with watercolor. Right, so let's get back to the next experiment that we're working on. And for this, we need, um, we need six boxes. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Like I said, get used to being, get used to being a little bit free with everything, your pencil, your brush, the whole schmuzzle. So here we're going to start with, and I'm going to actually label it. So I, I really advise you label things. So this is going to be dry paper and this is going to be wet paper. Both times, this is dry and this is wet. This is dry and this is wet. And we're going to start with ultramarine, just on its own, nothing else. And then we're going to add burnt sienna and we're going to let them mix on the paper. And same on both sides, but one's going to be wet first. But try and make your paint wet enough that it moves around really well. And you don't have to, I want to sort of show you what I mean. If your paint's dry, but I've got to try and get some dry paint now. It's not always easy to do things wrong. If I put dry paint on, yeah, that's kind of dry. If I put dry paint on here, it doesn't move around the paper. It's not going to blend with anything if it's dry. It has to be a wet puddle. Your puddle of paint in your palette has to look shiny and it has to move around. If you tip your palette, it has to move. You have to be able to move it. I'm going to put that, get a bit more water on my brush. I'm going to put that ultramarine on, just whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And you don't have to fuss with it. And I'm going to get some burnt sienna. I've got to remember to mix enough water with it. And I'm going to whoosh, 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 and mix quite enough paint and water. Whoosh, 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 and then just let it mix on the paper. And don't fuss with it. For this one, I'm going to wet the paper first. So I'll use my other brush. I've got two pots of water here, and I try to keep one pot kind of clean for wetting the paper it ends up that I forget to do that and and they both get dirty but that's I just get painting in the moment now put you'll see when you put your paint on the wet paper it will behave differently and I'm going to get the the burnt sienna and just let them mix on the paper having water on the paper first will really dilute the paint out so you're going to get a much much lighter effect but your paint will move about more on wet paper you can see this one the two colors together are starting to separate and granulate so we're going to do the same thing for this one but we're going to do water droplets falling on this so first of all on dry paper i'm going to put the ultramarine when you paint with the right consistency of paint, there is no uh, problem moving the paint around. It just moves easily. If you're struggling to move your paint around, it's not got enough water with it. And then I'm going to get some burnt sienna and put that on. 
See, I'm just kind of wiggling back and forth, just letting them blend. And I'm going to let that settle a little bit before I put the water drops on. So I'm going to the other side and doing the same thing on wet paper. Quite often to get a good effect with whatever you're doing, you do need to let the paint settle into the paper a little bit before you try your salt or your water or whatever it is you're painting. Look how that, look how that paint just zooms into the water. And when you're painting skies, that's a lovely, lovely way to get a nice, nice sky effect. Then I'm going to go in with my burnt sienna and just mix it a little bit on there and let's leave it in the water to do its thing. Now this is the cheap paper. It uh, is quite shiny for watercolor paper, quite smooth, not very textured, and it doesn't absorb the water in the paint like the cotton paper does. It's sort of the difference between a cotton t-shirt and a polyester t-shirt or maybe a nylon t-shirt. The cotton paper is so beautiful at absorbing the water and the sizing that they put on the cotton paper is usually gelatin and that helps to repel some of the water and just absorb it at the right rate. So it's, it's difficult to get some of these effects on the cheap paper, but you don't want to waste your gorgeous, expensive paper just plain. Now, this is just starting to dry a little bit. It'll stop being shiny when it starts to dry. And at that point, you can take either your, your brush or I, I have a little pipette too or a spray bottle. And I got a little pipette and I'm going to just drop this is more accurate. I'm going to drop some water blooms on there. Now, the way I did it yesterday, because I didn't have my little pipette with me, and iron oxide sell these. I think they're 99 cents in iron oxide. And you just squeeze the bulb at the top and it picks up water. I use it for ink mostly, but uh, I'm going to buy a couple more because they get a bit dirty and they're just so useful. You know, you can suck up ink, paint, water. The way I did it yesterday was to get water on my brush. This one's still a little, little bit wet to do it. And I just squeezed the brush to make a water droplet. Now, what you usually try and avoid these water droplets in watercolor because they will spoil your wash. If I show you the ones that we did yesterday, you can see where I dripped water and it pushes all the pigment and ruins a really nice wash. But it makes a beautiful effect. So suppose you were trying to make frost on a window or frost on a lake or stars in the sky or just a beautiful sort of background look where you've got mountains and clouds. I mean, you could turn this into a painting just with everything you have here. You could have like really snowy mountains in the background. You could, you know, just by doing something like putting a horizon line in, a horizon line in here and and turning this into maybe a, a reflection in the lake and then outlining this mountain a little bit more just adding a little bit of detail in a tree you could make this into a beautiful painting just by having a sort of a random background that's your starting point and if there's blooms that you don't like you can paint over them with your next your next layer. So you can see already I'm putting in a little bit of um, detail, maybe some shadow on these mountains. And when that's all finished, I could come along with a tree and grab, let me just grab some pre-made green. Well, there's some. If it, when it's all finished, I could just come along. If I wanted to put something in the foreground, it's going to be wet now, but I could put a and put a tree in the foreground. And I have I've made a little landscape just by using what was made with all the water droplets and I, it can suggest whatever it wants to me. I don't quite like this here. I had fixed something there, but they're fun. Not fun if they're in the middle of a lovely wash that uh, you really like. These ones are not working as well. I think they were a bit too wet. If they're too wet, the water won't have much effect at all. And then we're going to do on dry paper and wet paper, same two colors, 
but we're going to mix them in the palette instead of on the paper. So these have been these have been mixed on the paper. And now we're going to mix them first, like we did for our gray at the beginning. So I'm going to get my ultramarine blue. I think you can see what I'm doing. I have to let's move that so you can see my ultramarine blue and a little bit of the burnt sienna to make the gray. And I want to make it wet enough that I can paint with it easily. A little bit more water. See, it's got to move around. You've got to be able to tip your palette and that paint has to be able to move. Otherwise, it's, it's no good for painting with. Uh, I'm going to put this on my dry paper. Just so you can see what it looks like on dry paper. Now, I see a lot of painters, especially young painters who obviously don't have much training in painting. They probably taught themselves or watched other YouTubers and they paint so much back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that is not the way to paint. The way to paint is to put your paint on and leave it alone. This is going to settle into a nice flattish type of wash. It will start to granulate a little bit. This is this is what I see painters on YouTube doing. They put that wash down and then they go back again and they do it again. And then they grab some more paint and they do it again. And then they put some brown in it and they do it again. And that is just not the way to put watercolor down. It, it makes streaks in it. It lifts the paint up each time. It damages the paper because the paper is quite soft, the cotton paper. And you don't get a beautiful, beautiful wash. If you want it darker, let it dry and do another one over the top. I mean, where's my one from? Let's find one from yesterday that I can demonstrate that on. Okay, so let's move this out the way for a minute. So here's the mixed on wet and the mixed on dry from yesterday. Now, supposing I think this is too light. Well, I can go in with the same mixture and I'm going to go on dry paper and I'm going to, I'm actually going to make like a mountain range here to show you what two layers of the same color will do one over the other, or you can do a different color. So you've got a beautiful there. So I've got, if I want it darker, I can do it all over dark, or I could do one little place a bit darker. If I want to change this color up a bit, not just have gray, it's still wet. I can do what's called charging. I can get a little bit of rose into that color to make it a little bit purple. It has to, can't be too wet when you charge. It has to be a little bit drier. A bit of ultramarine blue, so I've made it a little bit purple. Now I can just touch, I can touch, I, I put ultramarine blue and a little bit of rose to make a sort of purple. And it has to be less wet than what is on here or you're gonna get the water droplets. I'm charging the color on here by just dropping a little bit of that darker violet color on there. I'm not painting back and forth, that will make a mess and it will take the other color off and it will make lots of streaky brush strokes. You have to be careful which YouTubers you actually watch. And when you actually see them painting, their picture they do is not as good as the one, the thumbnail. They've obviously photoshopped and touched up their thumbnail picture before they put it on YouTube. So I've got a little bit of purple there. I'm gonna put a little bit of purple in the reflection. And you can already see that second layers of color over light color make beautiful, beautiful layers of color that are so much nicer than scrubbing back and forth with the same color until this, this was one that I was showing yesterday how not to do it, you know, where they just keep going back and forth with the color. You just take paint off and leave lots of streaks and you don't get, you don't even see a beautiful granulation or mixing or anything happening. Now this one, because I put the lilac color on wet and just dropped it in, left it alone, it's all starting to blend with the gray by itself. And if I leave it alone, it's going to do some magic all by itself. And I just have to remember not to touch it anymore. 
Okay, now this, yeah, I think this yesterday was where we took a bit of a break. So, you know, you can pause me, but I'm not going to take a break. I'm doing all right here. And I take, oh, we forgot the last one. See, I get talking and I forget what I'm doing. The last one was to do that exact same thing on wet paper. So I'm going to wet the paper and I'm going to mix. I've made my gray purple now. I'm going to mix some more some more ultramarine blue burnt sienna gray. I tell you, I go through more ultramarine blue and burnt sienna than any other pigment that I buy. That's okay. You can paint a whole painting with the two of them pretty much. There, and I've got some more gray. And I'm going to put it on the wet paper. And of course, having it on the wet paper, even if it's the same strength of pigment, is going to make it much lighter than if you put it on dry paper. So if you want a softer, lighter look, put it on wet paper. And if you're not confident about painting quickly with one stroke, put it on wet paper because you'll have more time to get your paint down without getting brush strokes in it. And really don't touch it. Don't go back and keep painting it. You can do that with oil paint. You can do that with acrylic paint. You can do it with pastel. But watercolor is really meant to be put down and left alone until you do the next layer. Let's pop that over there. All right, we're going to practice before we do the good copy of today's little landscape. We're going to practice a couple of quick landscapes to get you painting quickly and loosely. There's, there's just nothing like practice to help you do something and to do it in a way that you're not used to doing it. So I'm just going to show you the two little little landscapes that I did yesterday. And, and for my, I can't remember which one I did yesterday now, and which one for my practice session. That was, hmm, who knew? I don't know. I think this was my, I don't know which was which. <laughs> this is yesterday. And I didn't finish these off because it was it was too wet to finish off these these little cattail things. So that's something, sometimes you have to just wait for something to be, to be dry before you can finish it off. You have to work on dry paper. So we're just gonna do two very quick, very quick little scenes to loosen up your brush strokes and try and, and um, make you not worry about, about what you're painting. Sometimes, sometimes you just need to let instinct take over a little bit. Get that one out. Oh, so many bits of paper now. Right. So for that, we are going to make. Uh, where's my pencil? We're going to make one in landscape format, so a rectangle in landscape format, and we're going to do one in portrait format, so a rectangle this way. The actual painting that we're doing today, the good copy, is is in portrait format. It's a five by seven, or you can do a four by six if you want to. You can go a bit bigger, but it's difficult to go bigger with some things because they're just constrained to a size. The amount of detail you put in something kind of just fits that size. If you're going to go to a bigger painting, you need different amount of detail or, or bigger brush or different ratio of measurements. So I would stick with five by seven if I was you. Anyway, we're gonna we're gonna, just gonna practice something before we get to that. So with this one here, I'm just going to. I always use, even if I'm loose, pretty much I use a ruler for a horizon line. So I'm gonna make sure that because a horizon line has to be straight, absolutely has to, or your whole painting looks off. So I'm gonna have a horizon line about a third the way up here and quite low on this one we're going to have quite a low horizon line on that one just pop those in with my ruler and we're going to start the top one i'm going to go to my my nice big brush the bigger the brush you use the looser you're going to be and we're going to going to wet this sky just a little bit we don't want it too too wet because this paper's hard to manage and we're going to start with the raw sienna I'm going to get my raw sienna and we're going to put that all around. We can actually put it down here too. If you, if you want, 
you can you can blend it in with a little bit of water down here because it's going to be like sky and water and i'm going to get a little bit of rose just a little bit and i'm going to bring the rose into the painting it's sort of going to be in this in the sky and i'm i just want a little bit more raw sienna in the sky there and then i want to use my gray I'm, I'm actually drying off my brush. I have a I have a sponge here. I usually have a towel. I don't know where I put my towel, but I'm just drying off my brush on my sponge a little bit. So it's not drippy, drippy wet. And then I'm going to get some of that gray I made with the burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. Um, just sweep in some clouds. It'd be very, very loose, very loose. And a little bit down here, a little bit in the reflections. It doesn't matter if the edges aren't straight. It doesn't matter what's happening. Really, you're just, you're just learning to be more loose with your brush strokes. And quite often you need to leave that alone to do its own thing. I'm gonna just fill into the horizon line with, with a little bit of the, the gray. And you can see with the cheaper paper, sometimes you get some like bits in your paper. It's, it's, it's uh, I don't know why, it kind of picks up little bits of paper in there. Oh, I just did a, um, a great demonstration of what happens when you, put, when you put water on your paint when it's not dry yet. I've got a little cloud there. While that is blending, fusing, blending in, we're gonna do this one. Sometimes you have to wait a little bit for your paint to, to fuse. We're going to wet this sky. Now I like to wet and then mix paint because the water needs to soak in a little bit if you've wet it properly. Sometimes you're too nervous and you don't wet it enough, but I like to wet it, let it soak in and then get my paint ready. So for this sky, we're going to need cerulean and some cobalt. We're going to use both of those. And I need to just clean a, clean a little space here from yesterday. And I'm going to get some cerulean here. This one is my M. Graham cerulean. It's very, very different to the Van Gogh cerulean. And then this is cobalt. This is, um, I think this is Daniel Smith cobalt. The Daniel Smith paints dry a bit harder, but the M. Graham paints are made with honey, so they're often quite sticky. I have this palette that will close up, but I don't like closing it up anymore because those sticky, sticky paints get stuck together. I've got my, my sky is still wet. I have, I'm going to start with my cerulean and just put this on really. Come on, let's be loose. You just like swish your brush around. And then I'm going to get a little bit of cobalt. The top of the sky is quite often darker. And I'm going to bring in the top of the sky here, some cobalt. And that's it for the sky. Don't fuss. Don't fuss with it. It will do something on its own. Just wait for it to do something on its own. Now I'm going to do this. I wet the top for the sky first, and I'm going to do the ocean or lake or whatever this is on dry so that I have a contrast. I've got a soft, wet sky and a, a dry look to the ocean. So I want it just a greeny blue. I can either use cobalt or I can use ultramarine, doesn't matter which. I'm going to add a little bit of yellow. I don't know what yellow you have, as long as it's bright. It could be cadmium yellow, azo yellow, oriolan yellow, permanent yellow, as long as it's one of your just bright yellows. And I'm going to mix a bit of that with the blue. I don't want it green green. I just want the water to look a little bit more green than the sky. And I'm gonna leave a, a completely dry white area uh, between the two and just go back and forth with that little bit of greeny blue to make water and wet my brush, dry, like really clean it out 
just tap it on my, I tap it on my sponge to get the excess water out of the state of my hands. Good God, what on earth? Um, with that slightly wet brush, clean wet brush, but not dripping wet, I'm just going to agitate that paint a little bit more. So I'm just painting with water, not paint. And then leave that before I do, I'm gonna do a little bit of tree work here. Now this one is drying off. And it has to sort of be dry before I do the, the mountain range in the background. If yours isn't dry, pause the video. And um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pause the video too. And I'm just going to use my hairdryer. So it's, so it's, um, I'm going over to my computer, pause, record. There. What I did was I paused the recording, got my hair, hairdryer out and gave it a good old blast with the hairdryer. Now on this one, I'm going to draw in very, very loosely a mountain range just here. And a little trick that you can do, it doesn't work very well with this cheap paper because it tears, but I'll show you how to avoid that. If you want to get a nice, straight, clear horizon line, you can put a bit of masking tape there to protect the bottom of your paper and keep this nice and straight. But you have to be careful. This has to be dry or it's gonna rip the paint off. And if you use it on cheap paper, I'll show you how you take it off. You can't just rip it off. You will get a great big tear. And I'm going to go back to that purpley blue that I made with, I made it with rose and a little bit of ultramarine blue to make a sort of a purpley violety blue color. Just, just because, just because it looks nice. And make sure my brush is filled with that. And I'm going to paint this mountain range. And I'm not going to worry about the bottom near the horizon because I have the masking tape there. But you do have to be careful. You don't like push it under the masking tape. If you have the right consistency of paint, your paint should just flow. You shouldn't be struggling to get paint off your brush. If you get halfway and you need to get a bit more paint, you need to go dip into your pigment puddle. Do that. Don't keep, don't keep going until your brush runs out because your color will get drier and drier and drier. You can always go dip back in your puddle. And that paint should just move easily across there and settle in easily. Don't go back and paint over it because you'll take the paint off, you'll streak it all up. What you can do if you want is to do what I said about the charging where you get stronger paint and you can just, just dab it on so that it flows in, but that's a little bit too dark and too strong. So I'm gonna get what's called a thirsty brush, which is a clean brush that I have dried and I'm gonna just suck that up a little bit so that it's not so dark. Now, to get that tape off, you have to use a hairdryer. You can pull it straight off of 100% cotton paper, but not anything else. Again, I'm going to pause while I do this, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this edge and I'm going to heat the glue on the tape. And as it gets warm, I'm going to pull it off, but I'm going to have to um, pause the recording because it's going to be way too noisy for you. There. Now, so I just heated it with the hairdryer and pulled it off gently, and it's it's fine. The last stage for this painting is to just do a little bit of foreground, and I'm going to get one of my very thin brushes. This is a number one script liner, or you can call it a rigger. It's a very thin brush. It's not wet at the moment. But when it's when it's wet, it does beautiful thin lines I'll demonstrate for you get the paint on the brush so I can usually you pull you pull with the brush so you can get a straight line by pulling and you can get lovely lovely straight lines actually what we're going to do we're going to flick upwards with the brush I'm going to well, I just don't have enough space here that's because I've got cameras and computers and stuff taking up all my painting space I'm going to do the ultramarine blue and burnt sienna again for the foreground grass, but I'm going to use a lot more burnt sienna. So it's more like a brown. 
And instead of pulling with the brush, like I just said you do, I'm going to flick upwards with the brush. My brush has got something stuck to it. One second. It's got to get got a, some kind of a little hair stuck to it. Let's try again. There we go. So I'm going to flick upwards in different directions to make some sort of marsh grass here and some uh, nice big one up here for some cattails and a few more. I'm going to switch to a little bit of uh, green just to switch up the colors a little bit. And don't have your grass all going in the same direction. Like it can be all over the place. And raw sienna. Raw sienna is a lovely color for I'm gonna mix just a touch of burnt sienna in it just to warm it up a little bit. So I can put some raw sienna in there too. If the raw sienna and the green are mixed together, lovely. You get some wet and wet happening. And the cattails can be burnt sienna. And they usually have a, a little bit at the top, little tail at the top. You need, you need a really thin brush for this. And of course, this is where you're tightening up. You're tightening up, you have some control here. And same down here, we're gonna tighten up a little bit and we're gonna put some very abstracty little trees. I'm going to tighten up so much. I'm going to go to my, hmm, I think I want my number, I don't know, is it my number four brush? I use my number two, number two one here. That's okay. I'm going to get oh, paint everywhere. I'm going to get some sap green. It's just a tube green. Uh, it's a Daniel Smith set sap green, which I think is the best green anybody makes. I'm going to add a little bit of ultramarine blue to it because I want it. You can't see, can you? over here. So this is the Daniel Smith sap green and it is the most beautiful color. They make it with their quinacridone gold and their um, phthalo green and I like to add a little bit of ultramarine just to just to darken it up a little bit and I'm going to put some along this little horizon here I'm going to put some wiggly wiggly trees like grass. I'm going to wiggle my brush to make some tree shapes. And this is water, so it's going to reflect in there. I'm going to go sort of horizontally down there just to make a little reflection. It's just, you know, it's just to pretend. Let's pretend we're doing a loose little picture and a little bit of water back and forth in that to make it look like it's in the water. I've got a wet brush and just like swishing the water back and forth to make that reflection a little bit blurry. That's it. If you if you love the look of little birds, find a little pen. I just want a really thin pen. I've got a 005 that's very, very thin, very thin. I could put a few little birds flying around in here if I want it, if you like that kind of a look. But that really just gives you two very loose, very quick little landscapes that you can practice. You could do all kinds of things. You could put a couple of trees. You could put a bit more grass. If you wanted to tighten up your painting and put something like a heron in the front here, fishing, you can tighten it right up and, and do something like that. Now let's um, put all this to one side. And I'm going to pause the video, get some clean water and clean up my area a little bit. And then we're going to get down to the proper Good painting. So you need to get a five by seven inch piece of paper ready, taped, taped down on your board, ready to do this little landscape, this first one that we're going to do. Right, I'm going to pause the video, get some clean water. And we're back. Now, if you have a piece of five by seven paper, which I have here somewhere, I have put in my instructions that you need your horizon line about one and a half inches up from the bottom of the paper. So, so 
I'm going to look for my ruler, which has disappeared under my all my paper. I'll use this other one. That's okay. So one and a half. One and a half is there. You go from the edge of the green tape. Got to be straight. You can't have it dipping down here. We make sure it's one and a half on both sides. And put your line across there for your horizon line. Now, this is good. 100% cotton ash paper. So I'm not going to worry about it won't tear with the masking tape. I actually buy this one in Dollarama, uh, Duramax. And it's one of, one of the best I found for not sort of sticking to the paper and just sticking just well enough that it doesn't let the paint through. So I'm going to make sure it's firmly down on here because I don't want the paint leaking underneath it. And we need to make puddles of Prussian blue, ultramarine blue, and then we're going to mix Prussian blue and burnt sienna, and we're going to mix ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, and we're going to mix burnt sienna and alizarin crimson. So we're going to have five puddles of paint. Now, I have explained that I like to wet my paper first and let the water soak in while I mix the paint. That just works for me. Other people like to mix the paint and then wet the paper. I just feel that when I wet the paper, it needs a couple of minutes to soak in. So let's get my hockey brush and get it wet. And I'm going to wet the top part, the sky. We're gonna work on the sky. And don't be mean with the water because if you are, you're not going to get a beautiful effect in your sky. You need to make sure that your whole paper is wet. You can tip it and see, is it all shiny? Are there any bits that are not shiny? It's cotton. It's going to absorb that water and it's it will be fine. It's much better to have it a little bit too wet than too dry and your paint's not going to flow. You can also use a Kleenex and you can just make sure that the edges are not, not quite as wet. Now, what we want right in the middle of this picture is we want nice white clouds in the middle. So we have to be careful to keep that white when we're painting the rest of it. And I've got to get my puddles of paint while that water's soaking in. I have to make my puddles of paint. So let's get, um, get my number 10 brush. And we want some ultramarine to start with. When do I not use it? Never. It's perfect color for everything. So some ultramarine. Now Prussian is a dark, um, cool blue. So it has like more greeny blue. I'm going to put that over here. Kind of just nice for the, the much darker stormy clouds. I'm going to put some Prussian over here. And it's nice to see the warm blues and the cool blues in the painting. So see how much I'm getting like paint in the puddle, paint in the puddle, not swishing it all around, but it's just paint and in the puddle. I have Prussian on my brush. I'm going to wet the brush a little bit more. So I'm going to put some here because I'm going to now mix the Prussian with, with burnt sienna to make a cooler brown or gray rather than the one with the ultramarine blue. So I'm there. Prussian with burnt sienna. Now wash my brush. We're going to mix ultramarine blue with burnt sienna to make our gray that we've been practicing this morning, afternoon. So there's the burnt sienna and the ultramarine blue. And the last one I want is burnt sienna with some alizarin crimson or one of the rose colors. I have a bit, bit of alizarin here. All I want to do is have a warm pinky brown color. So you can use any of your pinky rose colors with your burnt sienna to make a, a pinky, pinky brown color. Don't want too much of that pinky brown because it, it's a sky. You don't often see too much brown. I'm putting a little bit more alizarin in it. Right, my sky is still nice and wet. I want to keep that central area lovely and, and white. So I have to be very careful. So I'm going to start with my Prussian blue. Get a little bit more on my brush. And I'm going to sweep outwards from that central area with the Prussian blue. It's going to look very strange at the start of this painting 
because there'll be lots of lots of white showing still. And closer to the bottom of the page, the, the color is straightening out a bit more. So I'm washing my brush and I'm going to get my ultramarine now. Just ultramarine on its own. We're going to have some of that. I'm going to sweep that out. My paper, so my paper is real, really wet still. I'm going to take a little bit of the water off. Still really wet. And yours should be too, if you've wet it properly, should still be nice and wet. And I am now closer to the horizon, you want to have it much, much lighter. So when I get close to the horizon, I want to put some of that, that pinky, that pinky brown is sort of those clouds down here. Got a little bit more alizarin in that. I'm going to put some up here too. Now see how quickly I can lose that, that white in the middle or anywhere for that matter. And I'm going to have my Kleenex handy and I will, I will take a little bit back. I don't want, don't want it too, too dark in the middle, but I don't want to be doing too much Kleenex work either because that can get really ugly. I'm gonna, the, the, the borders can run back into your painting and make bloom. So I'm just drying up the border. I'm just putting a little bit more gray. Now I'm gonna wash my brush thoroughly. I did find it, I found myself a towel for my brush and promptly lost it again. Oh, here it is behind me. Right, I'm just, I've got a big towel now to keep my brushes not too wet because if everything gets wet, your brush, your paper, your paint, if everything's too wet, you're just going to end up with a really big runny mess everywhere. Now I want to go into the gray. I'm going into my Prussian blue gray first and I'm going to streak in from the, I need more burnt sienna in that. I'm going to streak in from the outside now. Remember I went in out and now I'm coming in the other direction. I'm gonna bring in some, some dark gray clouds. And I'm going now into my ultramarine and burnt sienna gray. A few more clouds coming in. It'll be different every single time you do it. I'm going to have a little horizontal clouds down here because closer to the horizon, they become a lot more horizontal. Now, this, this will lighten up as it dries. Watercolor does go much lighter as it dries. But I want to just pull that back just a little bit. I can put more dark cloud on after this is dry if I feel it needs a little bit more. And I know in my other one, I have a little bit of cloud down here in the pink, but you have to be very careful not to make it too, too dark. It's very subtle down here. Now I'm gonna pause the video while I just let this soak in and dry a little bit before we do the next steps. I'm just going to go up here to pause. Okay, now I've let it dry a little bit. Yesterday I took the tape off and did the water next and came back and did the, the trees afterwards. But in my instructions, I do say to do these trees before you take the tape off. So let's do it how I wrote it down. And the, there's two reasons for that. If this is still a little bit wet, it will make the trees nice and fuzzy on the wet paint, but it, you have to be careful it's not too wet or your trees will just swoosh up into your sky. And also it gives you a nice clean line for your horizon before you remove the tape. So the trees are going to be done with, with um, any of your, your dark mixes, any of your greys, and you can add a little bit more burnt sienna to make the trees um, a little bit more brown if you want to. I think the key is to keep changing changing the gray and changing the brown as you go across. And I suggest if you're right-handed, go from left to right so that you don't smudge your trees as you're painting. I'm adding a little bit more burnt sienna to my gray mix. And I'm gonna start, I'm gonna have one in front of me so I can see. Start over here, just, just 
pushing the tip of my brush up and you'll see on the corner here where it was wet it kind of like flows up into the sky so you do need to wait until it has dried a little bit and I'm going to go I've, I've gone into my more ultramarine blue color here and going across the the key is to have them different heights different sizes so you don't just have a row of equal size trees because that's really boring I'm going to go into the, the, the reddish sort of brown mix. Maybe make some of them a bit more deciduous looking and some maybe more like fir tree kind of things. Uh, let's get a little bit more brown in there. I've just switched into a little bit more. I put into the ultramarine blue, I add a little bit more burnt sienna. And I think now it's time to go a bit more into the the Prussian gray, a little bit more of the Prussian gray on my brush. And over, we can have a break in the trees here. They can, it's really good if you like wiggle, wiggle your brush about. So you get, you get some different brush strokes happening. A bit more burnt sienna maybe over here. Oh, let's go back into the, the Prussian, taller trees over here. And come down to your tape. Don't leave a don't leave a space. If you leave a space, it'll look weird when you take your tape off. You can always, if you feel like you need a couple more trees somewhere, you can. If it's all still wet, you can still put them in, but don't overdo it. It's, whenever you overdo something, you kind of spoil the initial lovely effect that you get. Don't take your tape off until this is dry. Otherwise, your paint is just going to all go under your tape. While, while that's happening, I just want to talk about the sky. Now, I put on this one, I put more clouds in when the, the first layer of sky was dry, just to give a bit more depth to the sky. And you put them on and mix them in with a wet brush. Now, my sky is still quite wet. My trees are very wet. So it would be terrible to put those on right now. It would start lifting the paint underneath and uh, making a not very nice look to anything. So. I'm afraid I'm going to have to pause again. I'm sure you don't worry about that and get my hairdryer going and uh, dry this up a little bit. So it's just... Now I've dried that quite a bit. And because this is cotton paper, I'm not too worried about the tape ripping because it comes off the cotton nicely. I did get a little bit of water going under here. Luckily it didn't come through my horizon. So that's okay. What we're aiming for is to have a lot of that light sky reflected by not painting these areas close to the horizon and in the middle here. We're going to put some dry brush for the water sort of sparkle on the edges. Now, dry brush means you're going to work on dry paint and you're going to make your brush fairly dry when you're painting with it. And that the way you do that, I'm going to mix up some more of our gray again because I use quite a bit of it on the trees so ultramarine blue and burnt sienna that one because I can wash it off if it if anything goes wrong so we've got that gray and I got it on my brush but now I want a dry brush so I'm going to have to dab a lot of that paint off seems wasteful doesn't it there's not really another way to do it and dab that paint off and you need a little piece of paper beside you to practice on to see if you've got your brush dry enough, too wet. I'm gonna dab it on the towel a bit more. What should happen is when you drag the brush across your paper sideways and you really do drag it, it should skip over the texture of the paper and leave just a little bit of paint. So we don't wanna go up near the horizon. Now it has to be uh, horizontal because it's water. Water finds its own horizontal and it needs to come across in horizontal strokes from the left and from the right. And remember you're leaving lots of white showing, but I'm going to just get the pinky color now. I had the gray color and I want the pinky color with the, the um, alizarin and the burnt sienna. And I'm gonna to have to dry brush again. So I'm gonna get it on my brush. This is where you need a, a paper towel or an old towel or an old face cloth or something that you can 
dab off the paint and always test it when you're doing dry brush because it might not be dry enough and even the testing it gets off gets off some of the the paint i want to have a little bit of that more pinky color reflected from the sky and i especially want that pinky color close to the foreground warm colors come forward and put that in there i still have lots of white you don't want to have too much white but you still need enough and at the the very foreground of this picture i'm going to have the burnt sienna color with a little bit of blue and a little bit of pink in it so i've got some sort of muddy flat so i've got my i've got my burnt sienna with a little bit of alizarin in my other box a little bit of alizarin in it so sort of a pinky burnt sienna now i can make that into a darker brown by adding a little bit of ultramarine blue and we've got a lovely sort of pinky muddy brown for the mud flats here it really just gives you a lovely foreground and ground your your picture And I'm going, remember, horizontally, I'm going back and forth to try and put that in so it's a more of a horizontal thing happening. If you want, you can wet your brush and just use a wet brush to do a little bit of wetting. But we're going to do that with, with the little islands. Now, the little islands that we're going to put in there are a mixture of, um, I've got it here somewhere. It's, you're going to have sepia, Prussian blue, ultramarine blue, and burnt sienna. So you're going to mix a very, very dark brown for your little island. So it's almost a sort of a black. And I, I will, I've already, oh, I can mix it over here. So I, I want my ultramarine blue, my Prussian blue. Then sepia is my dark brown. You can use uh, burnt umber. You can use Van Dyke brown. But I, I like I like sepia. I've got some sepia and some burnt sienna. And that's just making a really dark brown. Not much water. Now we're coming to the end of the painting. We're coming to the dark, dark colors. So remember at the very beginning of the lesson, we were mixing those colors with very dark paint, very um, dark values. That's what we want here. Not much water, quite a bit of pigment. And it, you can't wash your brush in between when you do this or you water it down too much. You can clean your paint box later. You start with, you know, one of the colors like blue and then Prussian, and then you go into your sepia and then into your burnt sienna and you get that mix with hardly any water. You might need to add a little bit of water just to get it moving. And then you can just clean up your paints later on. That's okay. I'll show you how you do that. You get some clean water on your brush and you just paint and paint again and you don't it's clean clean enough right, i want a little brush for these little tiny islands i had a little brush oh wait oh, i think it's back here hmm. there it is yep i have a little tiny brush here so i'm going to get that little tiny brush nice and loaded with some dark brown paint and we have a few little islands. Again, start over on the left because otherwise you're going to smudge it with your hand if you if you start on the other side, unless you are left-handed and then start on the right. I'm going to make a little sort of a mud flat and I'm going to have a little tiny bit of grass sticking up, tiny bit, and I'm going to have a little bit reflected. And then I'm going to get a another brush, preferably maybe a flat one, wet it. And I'm just going to pull it back and forth under there just to kind of blend that in and make like a, a watery reflection under that. Now these islands are all sort of different sizes. Just here, this one that's maybe a little bit bigger and it has a bit more grass. It's closer to you so you can see the grass a little bit more. Remember, we're, we're loose and free. We're not being too fuss fussy budget with this. Maybe I'll zoom in a bit. So you can see a bit clearer what I'm doing. I'm going to take that wet square brush and agitate underneath that little mud flat just to like it make it blend in, give it a soft edge, make it be like a sort of a little reflection in the water. Now we've got quite a big 
I'm going to get a little bit of that pinky brown too. We've got quite a big sort of mud flat island here. It goes way across. Because as we get closer to the foreground, you want more detail, more strength of color. And the grass here is closer to you. So we're going to see more of it. It's going to be a bit, bit higher, a bit, bit thicker. We can always put a little bit more there if you feel like you need a bit more. But this one is definitely closer to you. Remember, you're going to have the reflection underneath as well. And that's all going to be blended in with your wet brush in just a minute. I'm going to put some big, like, big grassy bits just in the corner here. Get my, get my wet brush and oh, I got paint instead of water. No, I just want just water on my brush. And underneath that, let's soften it, pull it back and forth. And if it softens too much, you can just go in with a bit more reflective paint. And there's one final one just here. This is your most foreground one. And again, do the, the loose flicking the grass, flicking the brush upwards to make the grass and then downwards. Don't make them all the same height. Don't make them all facing the same direction. You just need to know that the reflection needs to be the opposite, like the mirror, mirror image. And again, you can have a few extra bits at the corner. And my wet brush again, and I'm going to just, I'm going to get a little bit of that dark paint and I'm just going to just darken up that corner a little bit. And I'm feeling like I need a bit more gray in my reflection, so I'm going to get some, some gray, you know, that blue and, and burnt sienna. And I need a little bit more back here, just a bit more. So there. You need to make judgments as you, as you go along, make, go slowly and, you know, sort of think, oh, I need a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more watery there. Sometimes you can make it a little bit more watery, not so dry brush. There we go. Now, if I'm looking at the sky up here and thinking, I want a few more dark clouds up there. I'm going to bring some clouds in on dry paper across the sky. And again, I'm going to use my wet brush to just blend them in, soften them in across, across the page. And of course, as I soften them with my wet brush, they're not so not so dark, they're not so harsh. I'm gonna put a few of them in. And I'm gonna get a sort of a brownie, brownie color one down here for a little bit of streaky, streaky cloud. Wet it in with a wet brush. And I want a bit over here too to balance. You know, to think about balance in your painting. And pop those in. And if you wanted really, really few sort of soft clouds, you can. Once this is completely dry, you can wet this again. And if you want to bring in more, more cloud into a wet background, if you think that was too puny that you had up there, you can wet that so it comes in delicately, not, not with hard lines like this. These are soft lines. Now I'm just going to bring a bit, bit more drama to the, to the painting. And that's dry edge there, so I'm going to wet it up. And everything can be done in stages. You know, you can, you can figure out in two or three stages, where do you want a few more darks? You don't have to do it all in one stage because that can be very, very difficult. 
a bit more blue up there. there. So let's zoom out again. I'm sort of getting the effect I want, but I think I'm looking at it and I think I do, I'm just going to get pure ultramarine on my brush. I think I want a bit of pure ultramarine down here, just to have a bit of ultramarine in the, in the water. And we're nearly finished. Now my original one, I put some little ducks flying and I, I did a big cheat with that. I'm going to show you how I cheated with that. I have a little stamp and it's a little wooden, it's a little wooden stamp. Let me zoom right in again and see what I'm doing. I have some waterproof ink, so you can put this on at any time because it's waterproof ink. Get a bit of ink on there. And then I can stamp some ducks flying. I just stamped them in black, but I do have the option, let's wash that stamp. I do have the option of stamping them in light gray, waterproof ink. Actually, it didn't look very light, does it? And I could paint over those ducks with a tiny brush if I wanted to make them look like I had painted them. In the painting, I could get a very tiny brush and I could just paint over that light gray outline because it is waterproof if I wanted a more painterly look to the painting. I have other, I have other um, bird ones too. I have this one, which is a, I think it's supposed to be a flight of seagulls. You can sort of do multiple ones if you wanted. And I have another one, which is a lovely little flight of birds. I'm trying to remember what way round this one goes. I've forgotten. I have to stamp it to find out. I think it's that way. Anyway, so you could put any of those, any of those sorts of things on there, or you could uh, draw your own little birds with, <laughs> with a pen. I thought I had one more bird one. It's probably lurking somewhere. But I'm going to get the one that I did yesterday. Get the one I did yesterday. And put the, um, I had ducks on my other one. So I'm going to put the flight of birds on this one. The nice thing is with this stamp company, they actually give you a acetate one that you can put on your picture first to see where you see where you want to put them before you commit yourself. I'm thinking maybe, maybe there. And I've got to see what way up I've gotten. Maybe there. See how that goes. Who knows? Everything is. Once you do this, it's on there. This is permanent waterproof ink. We don't have a second chance. And because this is waterproof paper, I'm um, not waterproof, this is watercolor paper, I have to press really hard for a few seconds. Oh, that worked out okay. I got a flight of birds. I have other stamps of swimming ducks and geese and, and uh, different things. So sometimes I just do a little cheat at the end and put put something in like that. You could always use a pen to put a couple of extra ones somewhere if you wanted to. Don't forget to sign your painting if you're happy with it. I usually put a date on there. And quite often, if you don't want to put it in a frame, they look quite nice just as a, a card for somebody. It's always very, very nice when you get to take the tape off and I'm not worried too much because this is cotton paper it would not tear but you have to be careful at the corners because you can you can tear the corner if you're not careful so, now wait till everything is completely dry before you before you take the tape off but if if you put that on a nice blue or green background a gray background Make someone a very nice card with that if you didn't want to frame it. Okay, well, that's our painting done. Thank you for bearing with me.
Next week, we're going to do uh, four abstract tree paintings. So I need you to have four or five by five pieces of paper ready to do that. Five by five is the best. It's going to work best with this composition. And if you want to put four of them on a piece of 12 by 12 card, then that's easy to do because the five by fives uh, next to each other make 10 inches and then that's two inches left over which gives you a, um, a half an inch in the middle and a half an inch on each side so it works out really well and 12 by 12 backing card is everywhere michael's crafty capers it's a standard size scrapbooking card so easy to find if you want a nice background color so let's just switch back to my um other camera and say goodbye and i hope this video works <laughs> I hope this one works. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Bye-bye for now.